what I wanted to do today was really talk about sort of the basics of integrated weed management in multiple orchard systems. So it would be kind of hard for me and you know pretty repetitive uh, also to just do like, you know, weed management in apple, uh, apple orchards or peach orchards or uh, pecan, if you consider uh, nut bearing trees to be part of a fruit tree uh, group. So what I did was I really tried to encompass uh, weed management techniques and ideas that really could be applied to most, if not all, of these uh, orchard species. But of course, as we move forward, bear in mind that there might be certain specificities within your particular orchard system. Maybe the one thing I mentioned here might not necessarily be applicable and say, you know, one orchard system, even though it is encompassed in a lot. So <clears throat> if you do have further questions about specific systems and weed recommendations or information provided today, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. There's a lot of extension information out here that covers these specifically in different orchard systems. But as I said, we're going to really focus on uh, sort of concepts today and really the ideas behind why we Im would implement certain management techniques within these systems, if that makes sense. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about, <clears throat> if I can get my, there it is. We're going to talk about, you know, weeds in any cropping system really, but specifically re uh, weeds in fruit trees and orchards. So why are we worried about weeds? I mean, in general, some people are worried about aesthetics when it comes to weed management and other cropping systems, but that's not something we're particularly worried about in our orchard systems. I mean, yeah, it'd be great if they looked good, especially if we have uh, interactions with the public, we allow them to come onto our orchards and pick their own fruit, certain things like that. But for the most part, we're not really worried about the weeds detrimentally taking away from the way things look. What we're worried about in a sense is the competition for resources. And so that will have different impacts on different trees and different growth stages. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. <clears throat> Uh, they can negatively affect the harvest. So if you have a really high concentration of large weeds, it's hard for equipment to get in there. If you're hand harvesting uh, using ladders, if you have a great concentration of weeds that might create instabilities. If you have fruit that falls to the ground and is then picked up uh, for harvest, if you have weeds that are covering that up, of course that can make that difficult as well. We're also worried about this weeds harboring insects, diseases and other pests really. And we'll talk about that a little bit more on the other slide. Um, any type of uh, pest impacts to our orchards can have a negative effect on the actual trees themselves, but as well as their ability to produce fruit and not only produce fruit that is uh, usable for us as far as a usable crop, but is also of a certain quality that we uh, that is recommended for us to actually sell our produce. Our, our produce. So <clears throat> it may also affect crops in surrounding areas. So if you have, you know, gardening systems or, pardon me, my allergies are going kind of crazy today. If you have gardening systems that are located directly next to your orchards, or if you have an orchard next to another cropping system, like hay, chili, things along those lines, those can be counterintuitive. They can also be counter uh, detrimental, uh, depending on what's being done in one cropping system and whether or not it has the ability to impact what's going on next to it. <clears throat> Some weeds are really good hosts to pests especially in fruit orchard situations. I can't imagine a fruit orchard specific crop that does not have a problem with aphids. Uh, there are certain weeds that really attract aphids very well, like milkweeds, climbing milkweeds, common milkweeds, world milkweeds, also oleander, ornamental oleander, which is a very common landscape plant, not necessarily weedy unless it's growing in another area, but it can very highly concentrate uh, yellow aphids, whether or not those are uh, a particular pest to your, uh, your crop or not. Uh, sow thistles, annual sow thistle, prickly lettuce, anything that kind of produces a milky sap in a sense really seems to attract aphids as well as multiple mustard, type, uh, mustard plants. And as we all know, especially in the winter months, we have a lot of concentration of London rocket, shepherd's purse, flixweed, different types of mustards that are located within our area. <clears throat> Brown marmorated stink bugs, again, milkweed, mustards, they seem to really attract all kinds of different uh, insects. Uh, sunflowers is another one. Now, sunflowers, some people might not consider to be weedy, but if they're growing into an area where you don't want them to, of course they can. And actually some grasses can attract marmorated stink bugs. 
So uh, there are certainly grassy weed species that we have to take into consideration there. False chinch bugs. Uh, prostrate knotweed is a huge uh, germinating plant early in the spring. It's actually an indication that our, our other spring annual weeds are about to germinate. So very early in the season and when your trees are about to probably bud out, that knotweed can actually attract chinch bugs. Uh, spurge is another early growing, uh, early germinating summer annual weed. And of course, London rocket, everybody's favorite, apparently the insect's favorite too. Uh, Ligus and, and other stink bugs. Uh, clovers, that might actually be an issue if you have clovers present as your cover crop, like white clover, red clover. Some people do that because of the, uh, their benefits to pollinators. Russian thistle, lamb's quarter. Lamb's quarter is actually a native. There's a picture of it right over here. <clears throat> but it's certainly considered to be invasive in multiple cropping systems. And of course, it can also attract insects as well. Phyllids, or psyllids, pardon me, if you have a, a citrus orchards, orange trees, grapefruit trees, things along those lines, anything, lemon trees, anything citrus related, citrus greening is a huge issue right now, really in any place that's producing citrus, but especially in Florida and especially in California where the huge production systems are. Uh, beggar's ticks, which is a native, uh, sometimes invasive plant uh, in New Mexico, daughter, Daughter was a huge issue last year. It's actually a parasitic plant. It's that plant that looks like white spaghetti that's sitting on top of other plants uh, late in the summer, especially when there's a, a great deal of rainfall during our monsoon season. Also dog fennel, which is a very common landscape weed. So if your home is located next to your orchard and you have a landscape turf area, dog fennel was a huge issue within those areas as well. So weeds can also attract uh, rodents as well. Field mice, other types of rodents, gophers, they could cause damage to your tree roots, to your trees themselves, they can burrow, and they can also attract other uh, pests as well. So in many cases, these pest systems are kind of a, a cyclical <laughs> um, system. <clears throat> Why are we worried about weeds and fruit trees? The degree of damage from weed competition is directly related to multiple, multiple uh, things. So weed composition, of course, is going to be a huge issue. What type of weeds do you have? Are they present within your orchard? Are they present in the surrounding areas? How many of those weeds are present? The more dense the population of certain weeds, the greater the impact, regardless of the stage of the growth of the actual crop. And it also impacts pretty much all uh, systems within orchard production from transplanting to trying to grow mature trees to uh, whether or not your trees are going to be impacted by other pests and of course harvest as well. Also it's going to be important is the growth stage of the trees themselves. Prior to establishment and in the developmental stage are probably going to be the most impactful as far as the weeds that are present. We'll talk about that on the next slide. But we also have to consider non-bearing and bearing stage, especially when it comes to some of our management practices, especially herbicides, uh, but also the method that the fruit is harvested. So certain weeds present, again, can be hindering to your harvesting process or make that more difficult, increase compaction, and we'll talk about that. Prior to planting young trees, critic, that this is the critical time. When you are preparing your orchard to transplant trees, to, uh, <clears throat> to develop a certain area for a future orchard location, this is your opportunity to go in and nuke whatever perennial weeds you might have in that location before you bring in your desirable crop and before you have that limiting factor that you have to worry about damaging with your management uh, options. And especially when it comes to perennial weeds. Perennial weeds like field bindweed, Bermuda grass, nut sedge, Johnson grass. The reason being is that these weeds are extremely aggressive. They easily outcompete other weeds. Once a population establishes, it's kind of there. They have underground root systems that they're able to grow back from, establish from, and also make it very difficult to control. Uh, field bindweed, for instance, uh, what we're worried about for managers is the underground root system. If the root system survives, the plant survives, and those roots can extend up to 40 feet deep in the soil. So when you're talking about how impactful your management is going to be, it's going to take multiple management practices, multiple times of injury, timing your, in your injury for the timing in which is going to be the most impactful against the weeds, and it's going to take multiple seasons. Even with all of that work, it's very difficult to control a population of perennial weeds. 
You can manage them, but for the most part, you're really not going to eradicate them. And in many cases with these particular weeds, management practices that are specific to integrated pest management, particularly organic systems, are not going to be very impactful. You really do have to utilize herbicide usage in some of these weed populations if you're going to control them. We'll talk about that. You don't have to, but that is probably going to be the best and easiest way to control them. Taking time to manage perennial weeds prior to establishment will pay for itself in the long run. An ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of the cure. Because I mean, when you talk about establishing, again, an establishing population that's only going to get worse and spread more and get worse season after season after season, that means you might have to replant some trees. Excessive weed control is going to actually dip into your production uh, profits, uh, increasing production costs, your quality, as well as how much of the fruit that you get might be impacted depending on the stage. And of course, if you do have to utilize herbicides to control some of these more difficult weeds, there might be some herbicide damage uh, to your crops. And we certainly don't want that. Young, actively growing trees. This is when weeds have the greatest impact. Prior to planting the trees is your opportunity to go in and control the weeds that are already there. As far as the weeds having impact to the trees that you're transplanting or you're planting, this is when weed presence is going to have the most ability to actually damage your tree growth and vigor. So competition is especially high during this case because if you look at it, those roots are pretty much right on par with each other and trees are very slow growers. Weeds are not. So those roots can actually spread more effectively. They can still water and nutrients away from your uh, developing trees, especially if they're going through transplant shock. And so that can be highly, highly detrimental to their health. There's also limited use of herbicides during this period because you have young trees. So of course, I'm not saying you have to use herbicides in your orchard system, especially if you're in organic production. But if you do, this is the timing when it's probably gonna be most detrimental to the health of your trees, most likely going to cause damage because the trees themselves are young, susceptible, and they're stressed from, the, uh, from being recently transplanted. They're also at their most susceptible to being damaged from other pests and other uh, vectors of diseases that weeds might actually attract. When you look at the non-bearing stage, depending on what type of tree you plant, that could be anywhere from the first five to even up to 10, maybe more than that years after planting, depending on your fruit type. That's a lot of seasons for different populations of weed densities to develop. So during this stage, you know, you don't have the actual fruit production to help with production costs. You're not yielding any net benefits from that orchard. You're really just implementing costs in order to keep them healthy, to keep them maintained so that you do get to that bearing fruit stage. So during this time, it's really important to set a goal to try to eliminate weed competition as much as you can while still simultaneously protecting your trees. Heavy weed infestations can actually delay that maturity and can extend the amount of time prior to your tree actually producing any type of uh, uh, crop. Tree age should always be in consideration, especially when you're selecting herbicides for weed control. There are specific statements on the label that will determine whether or not that herbicide can be used, how it's applied, when it's applied, soils that it can be applied in, and weeds that it can be controlled based on the growth stage of the trees. So that is something that we certainly cannot ignore because of course we wanna minimize damage. Trees are still susceptible from damage to herbicides even in their mature form and even before they're able to produce fruit. When you get to the bearing stage, it's generally gonna be a little bit more tolerant of herbicide applications than all the other pre uh, previous stages that we've talked about. As far as severe weed infestations causing damage at this point, it's usually going to be impactful to harvest. It's usually also going to be impactful to vectoring other pests that might cause damage to trees during that bearing stage that could have an effect on yield and crop. So as far as like direct competition with the trees themselves, trees are mature at this point. Herbicide weeds can't really compete for water and nutrients per se, but there are certainly still other things we need to worry about and make sure that we're not having weed infestations during that period too. If we follow all of these guidelines, weed control should be easy, right? There shouldn't be a problem. Well, unfortunately, it's not always that easy. Weed management success is going to be directly related in, as, into as much as you utilize a concept called integrated pest management or for the purpose of this presentation, we'll call it integrated weed management. And I'll talk a little bit more about what integrated weed management here is in, is in a moment. So everybody's heard the term integrated pest management, IPM. Everybody's heard about how important it is. 
So why is there still a weed or a pest problem? We're implementing IPM. Why isn't it working completely? Well, it's difficult to implement IPM in large cropping systems. You know, utilizing scouting, tillage, hand removal, spot spraying, problems with herbicide selectivity. Some herbicides you can't apply in certain orchards, so there's limited selectivity there. There are multiple different facets of how to control these weeds, and also depending on their timing as well, that make this a little bit more difficult. And so the basis of it is, is that you're usually putting in time, you're putting in cost, trying to control a plant. If you're not utilizing the ideas behind integrated pest management and timing your management for the more effective control of the weed itself, in a sense, you're basically just doing the same thing over and over and over again and not yielding very much results. And unfortunately, when it comes to weed populations, I guarantee you the timing that is going to be most appropriate to control or implement your strategies is not going to line up with your personal schedule ever. At the same time, you're implementing all of these inputs. It's taking time. Sometimes it takes time to actually see the benefits of what it is that you're doing. And this is all happening at a time when you're not yielding hardly any profit. So in a sense, it can be very discouraging. But we need to continue implementing the strategy because when you talk about sustainability in weed control, this is where it's at. So when we get into the actual weed control of fruit trees itself, again, the most important concept that we have to look at is integrated pest management, or for the purpose of this presentation, integrated weed management, because we're talking about weeds. Integrated weed management is the combination of as many practices as you can possibly put together, combined together to cause more injury to the weed as to cause as much injury to the weed as possible with as little inputs from you. So not only is it combining cultural practices, mechanical practices, and we'll talk about each one of these, but combining them together in a way that is specific to the weed itself. In order to successfully implement all of these management practices here in a more successful way, you have to target the weed itself. There are timings for each one of the weed that are more appropriate for you to come in and interfere with their process. That timing is always going to be when the weed is young, not small, young. So in many cases, most of these options here are going to be a lot more successful in annual weeds than they're going to be in perennial weeds. Because the benefit that we have is annual weeds germinate from seed every single year. Usually we can pinpoint when that germination is going to occur so we can target our management when the weed is young. So in that sense, how do we even start to combat uh, perennial weeds? And what if we're late? What if the annual weeds have already germinated? After that, the most important timing to implement any of these weed management strategies is going to be when the plant is actively growing. So that's usually going to be in the early spring and in the fall. So when we target our management for that, we're interfering with a process that is causing the plant to use up its own energy and grow in some way. Either it's developing roots to survive the winter and the fall, or it's growing back from underground root systems or germinating from seed in the spring. If we interfere with that, that causes much more damage. The other thing is if you may implement weed management when the plant is in survival mode, it's hot, it's dry, uh, the plant is extremely stressed, it's going to shut down. So any of your management is not going to be as impactful because this plant is in survival mode, especially if you're applying herbicides. Systemic herbicides are not going to absorb into a plant and translocate where they need to. So in a sense, it is a 100% wasted application to make applications outside of those timings that I talked about. So the other thing to think about with integrated weed management is it's a little bit of a misnomer to think that it is management in the absence of herbicides. In reality, integrated weed management is trying to utilize as many of these practices as possible first. And then only if these practices are not successful, then we might try to integrate a chemical uh, method of control. Save the big guns for the big weeds. We've been far too dependent on this, uh, on this option for far too long, and that's getting us in trouble with resistance. It's not as effective, and of course, we have off-site damage when we over-apply things. So 
uh, herbicide chemicals and herbicides absolutely have a place in an overall integrated pest management strategy. But the idea is utilize all of these methods first. Most likely they will be successful, especially against annual weeds if you time it correctly. Again, when they're young, before they produce seed, before they produce underground roots, or when they're actively growing. And then at that point, if these work, then we don't need these over here. We can save those for say the perennial weeds that are not going to respond to these others very well. Talking about integrated pest management, it starts from the very beginning. I talked about that just a little bit earlier in that before you even plant the trees, this is your opportunity to start controlling weeds. But at the same time, from the beginning, start monitoring your weed populations, keep a journal. And I'm not talking about a dear diary, I walked in the garden today and I felt really great. I mean, that's amazing if you did. If you wanna keep a journal like that, that's perfectly fine. And I'm talking about a weed journal. Actually start taking note of the weed populations that you have, where they're located. Find out as much about those weeds as possible, starting with accurate identification because your management is going to be more specific when, it, when you're talking about grasses versus broadleaves, when you're talking about annuals versus perennials. We already talked about how those might be different here. When are the germination flushes? When are they actively growing? The only way that you can know anything about these three and how to time your management is if you know what the weed is. So the first step is always going to be accurate identification. And if you don't know, we can help you with that here at New Mexico State University. We have a plant diagnostic clinic here on campus. Send us your plant specimens. I'll help you try to identify them. And then we can start developing a management strategy for you. Prevention is a huge aspect of how successful weed management or your IPM is going to be. Because if you prevent a weed from coming into your location in the first place, that's one less plant that you have to deal with later, especially if that one plant can produce 600,000 seed especially if that one plant has a 40 foot deep taproot system, has rhizomes, has stolons, has tubers. One less plant that's actually going to be a problem for you later on down the road. And maybe one less plant that's going to cause a huge infestation in a short amount of time. The ways that you can do that is to really also focus your management on areas surrounding your orchard. Keep an eye on irrigation canals, ditch banks, the roadsides surrounding fields, areas where your equipment is parked, Travel from where, uh, where your equipment is parked over to your orchard. Are you passing through weedy areas in the meantime? If that's the case, clean your equipment before you enter your orchard. Remove all of those seeds. Don't introduce them into your orchard in the first place. If you utilize cover crops, uh, if you plant seed for those cover crops or you use intercropping, we'll talk about that, use certified seed. That means that the company has taken uh, measures to actually remove contaminants from that seed bag before you purchase it. They're going to be more expensive, but again, that might be a better cost to utilize at the very beginning and not have to worry about it taking over your orchard and costing an astronomical amount and having an impact on the actual production yield and profitability of your orchard. Monitoring. So on top of keeping that journal, it really is important to walk through your field to monitor for the development of populations as they develop. The easiest populations of weeds to, to, to control, regardless of the management strategy that you use, are going to be the populations that are small, that are isolated. The more that they spread, the bigger the problem is, the less likely that our management is going to be as effective, and we may have to implement multiple, multiple over multiple seasons. Again, correct identification is going to be crucial. Early detection, rapid response. That's sim uh, similar to what I was saying just a little bit, a uh, couple of minutes ago in that this is the most, or a very important concept when it comes to weed management. When you detect a weed population developing in your orchard, respond to it, do something about it. If you wait, the longer you wait, the more the population is going to spread, the more difficult they become. The thing to remember with weed management, regardless of the management practice you use, is that the early bird catches the weed. The population is small, management's going to be easier. If the plant is young, management is going to be easier. Not only is management going to be easier, but they haven't had a chance to develop astronomical amounts of seed or underground root systems that your herbicides or your other management practices can't uh, reach. Weed management during active growth is gonna be the most successful. I just talked about that after that period, if uh, they've already germinated, they're not young anymore. Time them for active growth. Keep track of the management that you implement. 
and how successful it is. And if you find that you're implementing management and it's successful against certain populations of weeds and not others, then you still have to make adjustments for these other populations. Otherwise, what you're going to do is allow for a population shift. So if your management is very successful at controlling these weeds, that gives these weeds the opportunity to continue to spread and become a problem. And pretty soon, you're going to have to completely do a 180 on your management strategies in order to just be impactful. <clears throat> Compare information with what you've done in the past, with your weed populations in the past, how they spread, management methods, and how successful they are, and share this information with your neighbors. You don't know your neighbors could be the one who are providing your weed populations for you. If you actually work together on how to control them, then that eliminates that uh, that entrance of that weed into your system, further helping prevention. There's a little bit of a misunderstanding between cultural practices and mechanical practices. Cultural practices in weed control has to do with how you manage your desirable plant. So in the system of an orchard, uh, tree spacing is important, how much you irrigate it, how much you fertilize it, how much you prune it, anything you do to make your plant more healthy is going to outcompete oncoming weeds. But that's a little bit of a problem in an orchard system because obviously there's these open spaces that weeds can take advantage of. So another cultural practice that we'll talk about on the next couple of slides are going to be utilizing crops or plants within that area to continue to help with that competition with incoming weeds. And when you're talking about an organic production system, this concept combined with preventative and physical removal are going to pretty much encompass the vast majority of how effective you're going to be against these weeds. And cultural practices, that competition has a huge, huge role in that. So when you talk about cultural practices equals good management, good management equals out, uh, out competing uh, weed populations equals weed control and more productive trees. So tree spacing absolutely could have a, uh, a uh, a place in that. You don't want to plant your trees too close together because that could affect your other diseases, other insects, it could stress your trees out, but you also don't want to plant them so close together that you shade the lower canopy excessively. Because if you're trying to utilize a cover crop, that could be actually detrimental to its growth. I, there really are very few plants that can grow densely in a mat on the floor that you would need with a cover crop that are 100% shade tolerant. They have to have sunlight in some situations. And in many cases, more sunlight than you probably would, would think. Pruning costs also increase when they're uh, uh, clumped together because you have to continue to open that canopy. You might also be actually taking away uh, branch space that would produce fruit. But also, as I mentioned, closer canopies increase pests, increase diseases, increase the impact of the in uh, insects to your trees. Anytime your trees are stressed, you're gonna have to worry about uh, pests and their impacts. Irrigation. What is your irrigation source? If you irrigate through river water, then it might be that you're actually bringing in contaminants like weed seed every single time you water. How do you combat that? You keep combating them every time they're young and they germinate. That would indicate to you that when you've irrigated in the few weeks following that irrigation, you're probably going to have to keep an eye on uh, weeds that might be germinating from that seed that you brought in. Uh, low spots in the field as well. Uh, trees, just like other plants, need air, water movement in the soil. When those soils are saturated, it stresses your trees. It also stresses the area around the trees and gives weeds a competitive edge, especially if they like saturated soils like nutsedge. Fertilization. Fertilization for trees. Trees are a slow growing, growing plant, but they do also give indications of when there are nutrient deficiencies in the soil. In a sense, you only want to fertilize your soils when the soil indicates that there is a deficiency. And the way to do that is going to be a soil test if you don't want to wait until your tree is stressed, especially when you're talking about micronutrients. Micronutrients are only needed in a small amount, but can actually be uh, limiting, uh, especially in some of these uh, arid uh, soils, high pH, highly calcitic soils. And there might be that there's an indication that there, the uh, mineral is actually present, but it's so bound by the high pH that the plant can't take it up. The best indication as to when that is occurring is going to be a soil test or to a greater degree when your trees are stressed. 
Also, you can sample leaves for nutrients to fit nutrient deficiencies, but only fertilize when you have a deficiency. So otherwise, you can be adding way too much of a nutrient into the soil. You get a nutrient imbalance, and that is just as detrimental to the health of your trees as it is having a nutrient deficiency. And it's very difficult to remediate. Talking about cover crops, any situation where you have a living system, when you have roots in the soil, are going to be much more beneficial than having bare soil and just putting something on top of it as a barrier. So cover crops, they will use water. Although I get a lot of questions about competition with some of the cover crops, like certain grasses, like Bermuda grass, some clovers, but it does also improve water penetration into the soil. It improves water conservation. So having that root system and that buffering capacity present in the soil actually keeps the water present in the soil longer for your trees to take it up. So it actually is a beneficial relationship. Yes, they will take up water, but you know, a couple of inches of Bermuda grass are not going to be able to outcompete a giant tree for the amount of water it's going to be take out of the, taken out of the soil. You want to, it also helps to improve soil quality. Again, having that root system there, you have a very active rhizosphere as opposed to having just bare soil. The rhizosphere is the area in which you'll have the most activity from microbes, from beneficial bacteria, beneficial fungi, and those circulatory and those um, uh, <clears throat> processes that actually help make nutrients um, more available for plant uptake. Without that there, they just become bound by the soils and you might have nutrients present, but the plant can't take it up like I mentioned previously. It helps the harvest. You can uh, minimize the amount of dust, the amount of soil erosion that is lost just by having your equipment, having people in the orchard harvesting. It limits compaction just because there's something in the soil that prevents those soil particles from actually compacting and clumping together. And it also improves traction. So if you have uh, uh, tractor equipment or large equipment, you're gonna be able to do a lot more with those tire spins and cause less damage uh, to your floor if you have that cover crop present. Just, it's just better for that. In a sense, it's like a living mulch. And again, a living mulch is always going to be better than just having a, you know, uh, a bark mulch sitting on top. Now, there is also a concept called intercropping, where instead of just using a permanent cover crop like grasses, like clovers, you can actually intersperse a cropping system within your orchard. So in a sense, it's an agronomic process of growing two crops or more crops within the same field at the same time. So with intercropping in orchards, it's not unusual to have this row spaces between your orchard trees actually growing some type of high profitability crop like vegetables. Or if you're, uh, if you're looking for something more stable and more permanent, but something that you can still utilize and harvest, uh, forage might also be beneficial like alfalfa or uh, winter wheat or triticale or uh, fescue, especially if you have livestock that could actually be foraging within your orchard, utilizing that space for something else and also growing something, uh, a cover crop that can be useful and profitable for you as far as the inputs that you put into it like water and fertilizer instead of just having a plant there that you have to manage. What you want to make sure is that the water requirements and the harvest requirements of your intercrop do not directly clash with the needs of the fruit tree. So if you're trying to grow a vegetable here that doesn't require uh, similar or the same amounts or isn't uh, going to be healthy with the amount of water that you need to provide for the specific type of tree that you have, maybe pecan with flood irrigation, then that's not going to be the crop for you because, again, you're just going to be putting in inputs. You're not going to be gaining anything from that. So as far as choosing which intercrop, uh, if you want to go that route, that's going to be a huge uh, thing to consider as far as how you manage the orchard. You want to try to manage them both simultaneously in a sense. So you're not putting in extra effort, if that makes sense. Ground covers, basically putting in a cover on the surface of the soil if you have bare soils underneath. Landscape fabrics, usually covered by mulch on top, creates a thicker barrier and a more aesthetically pleasing barrier. The important thing to consider with these is that you really need to allow water and air movement through whatever barrier you put down. If you don't, that's going to be detrimental to the roots of your tree. It's going to increase the level of disease, stress within the tree, and that means insects are going to actually move in and cause damage. So as far as like a thickness goes, if you want to utilize uh, landscape fabric in a mulch, 
You could put the landscape fabric down. That could be anything from like an interwoven fabric that's biodegradable, that has space that allows for air water movement, or it could be a, again, like I said, a biodegradable layer, like straw, for instance, if you uh, have extra that you cut from your, your forage field, as long as it doesn't have weeds in it. If you're gonna put mulch on top, you wanna aim for about a thickness of about four inches. Uh, three to four inches, you could get away with anything less than that. The mulch is basically just going to disperse. It's going to spread. Anytime you open spaces with these ground covers and allow light penetration, weeds are going to germinate through that and you're still going to have to maintain them. You also don't want too thick of a barrier because if you can't allow that water and air cycling through, you get the same problems as you would if you just put down a basic plastic. You're not gonna have any benefit to your trees. You're actually gonna cause a lot of damage. There's a lot of benefits with that. Not only does it suppress weeds, um, it can improve soil quality, water conservation. As I was saying, it's a barrier that kind of holds that water there, doesn't allow it to be evaporated as easily. Uh, there's also nematode suppression benefits just because you don't have that open uh, system in sunlight that they can benefit from as well. But at the same time, if you're using this method against an entire orchard, that's going to require a large volume of material. And this material doesn't last forever. It breaks down. It does have to be replaced probably every five to eight years. So that's something to consider if that's going to be a, uh, a cost that's going to interfere with the productivity of your orchard. I get a lot of questions on solarization, basically the use of plastic on the surface of the soil to trap heat. In a sense, it traps, you're trying to trap so much heat that it actually burns away or damages any of the young plants that are present, as well as potentially seed. Most people would think that black plastic is going to be better for trapping heat, but in reality, it's clear plastic. Black plastic actually reflects UV light. Clear plastic traps it better, and you're able to concentrate more heat in the top portion of the soil. The problem, at the same time, you also have to keep that plastic present for an extended period of time, almost like six weeks during the hottest time of the year, which is going to be in the late spring and throughout the summer. The other thing to consider is that if you have a canopy over the top that's causing shade, you're probably not trapping as much heat as you could if you had like an open planting system like here in this picture. So there are always pros and cons that we have to consider, especially with soil solarization. When you talk about trapping heat, trying to get heat, uh, the, uh, the, the, the heat underneath the plastic to reach about 140 degrees Fahrenheit, that's going to be effective on probably small plants like annuals. It's not going to be effective against mature weeds that have already germinated and especially perennials. The soil acts as a very good buffering uh, area and that heat's not gonna be able to penetrate very far down. So any underground root systems that those plants can grow from are not going to be affected. And in, in, in some cases, seed especially can survive really hot temperatures, even open flames. So you're not going to be able to essentially kill weed seed just by trapping heat. And unfortunately, you don't even get the benefit of blocking sunlight, especially if you're using clear plastic. It could be limiting for harvest because if you have this plastic present within the rose uh, in between your, your orchard that could be limiting on what type of equipment you can drive on top of it. Because if you get breaks or if you get tears in that plastic, you don't trap any more heat. You get weeds that germinate. Again, the plastic doesn't allow water and air movement through. So you still have to contend with not really having a healthy soil system that could be detrimental for your trees. And it's again, it's only effective on young annual, annuals and not perennials. So in a sense, if you're going to be looking at putting a barrier down, I would say you're probably gonna be a lot more successful weed control wise with using an effective uh, amount of landscape fabric or mulch or a cover crop or intercropping. I probably wouldn't utilize soil solarization. I think it's gonna be cumbersome and you could actually damage your trees and your soils in the, in the process. <clears throat> Mechanical practices, the use of tools. So cultivation is gonna be a huge aspect of that, especially in organic systems. However, there are systems that are trying to move away from cultivation, from tillage, especially trying to prevent soil erosion, trying to maintain soil health. And if you have uh, a cover crop present there, of course you can't till it. But you can uh, till alleys, middle rows. You really wanna try to till them shallowly. You really don't wanna try to do any type of deep tillage because many of those tree roots are gonna be a lot closer to the surface than most people would probably think. 
You can utilize them multiple times throughout the year. The more that you do it, the more erosion you cause, the more damage to your soils, the less likely you're going to have that beneficial uh, soil quality uh, relationship with microbes in the soil. And most likely you're going to have weed issues. But of course, when you shadow till, if you have a problem with annuals, they can just you know, take those annuals, cut them down. If you do that before they produce seed, you'll start to realize, or you'll start to notice that the pop, you'll start to notice fewer populations germinating from season to season because you're essentially depleting the soil bank. You want to leave about a one to two foot minimum strip away from the tree, uh, from the trees with cultivation, especially if you have exposed tree roots, the closer that you get to the tree, the more likely you're going to have actually cause damage to some of those anchor roots that are pretty shallow to the, pretty shallow to the surface. So this isn't really a method that you can utilize to control weeds that are going to be located close to the tree. So just utilizing tillage alone, pretty much the same with all of the management that we're going to be talking about. You can't control weed populations in a sustainable way, only using one practice. You're going to have to use multiples. That's the whole basis of IPM. You can also mow weeds. Some weeds don't like to be mowed at low mowing heights, especially tall growing weeds like kochia, Russian thistle, uh, palmer amaranth. They can grow at low mowing heights, but they're probably going to be highly stressed. They're not going to drop as much seed into the soil. But at the same time, that could actually allow for other population shifts for weeds that do love to be mowed at low mowing heights, especially your grassy weeds like your foxtails, your crabgrass, uh, nut sedge loves to be mowed at low mowing heights. So utilizing mowing alone is not going to get rid of all weed species. It can help with uh, its production of seed as usually seed is produced at the top of the plant, but a lot of these weeds have adapted to produce seed at very low heights. So mowing is not going to eradicate seed production alone. Uh, be careful not to damage exposed roots careful not to nick them with the blades, especially if they're raised. So uh, that's something to consider. You can get close to the trunks if you want to, as the gentleman does in this picture here. But again, if you have a, a type of a tree or if you have an orchard that uh, has a really high concentration of exposed tree roots, like say pecan orchards, for instance, probably not going to be able to get very close to the tree with this. <clears throat> Other mechanical practice can be, uh, that can be utilized might be including using flame using open flame to actually burn away the surface of the weeds that are present. Very good way to get rid of stress, <laughs> especially if you have a flamethrower, just go out. You can use a handheld propane torch. There's also equipment that you can use like a tractor that actually pulls a propane um, a tractor behind it that actually concentrates flame to the direct surface as you see here in this orchard, in this vineyard. You can use handheld um, uh, devices like you see here. Um, this is going to be a lot more effective on annual weeds for the same reason as uh, cover cropping, as uh, sorry, as mulch, as solarization are going to be effective. The soil acts as a really good buffer. Anything that can grow back from those underground root systems, those root systems are probably not going to be affected by open flame nearly as much as what's going to be affected on the surface. You can burn away some of the seed that are present on the surface, but anything that's located underneath is probably not going to get hot enough to destroy a seed. Some of the seed has the ability to even survive open flames. And in some cases, um, you might actually damage the seed enough to promote it into germinating. We call that scarification. And I probably don't have to mention that it might be cumbersome, especially in an arid situation with high winds, especially with all of the wildfires that we have going on in New Mexico. So this is certainly something that we have to be careful and consider uh, when we're utilizing this method. Physical labor, hand hoeing, hand pulling, digging. It's the oldest way that we've controlled weeds in the book. Haven't developed a resistance to it yet. Best way to control weeds in an organic system. I get a lot of questions like, what's the most effective method of weed control organically? The answer is always going to be your hands. However, it can be extremely expensive, especially if you have a large orchard acreage. Increase in time, labor can cause your production costs to go down. Uh, sorry, your uh, profits to go down, increase your production costs. It also can be limiting. You know, maybe your crew that you hired to actually hoe the rows or right up next to your trees miss a weed and that weed drops more seed and then you get right back where you started uh, later on in the season. I get a lot of questions on biological control. We're kind of running out of time. 
So I'll go through these pretty quickly. Biological control is extremely limiting to the location in which they're located, but also the weed in which they target. Their applicability is dependent on whether or not those populations are present, whether or not they can actually maintain the population of the insect itself. Fruit orchards, biocontrol is usually going to be more focused on utilizing insects to attack, or beneficial insects to attack your uh, pest insects and prevent diseases in that way. Usually biocontrol is not going to be focused on weed control in an orchard system. Here are a couple of examples of biocontrol. Probably the most successful is going to be livestock foraging. You can certainly release uh, so your goats, your horses, your cattle to try to mow down some of those weeds that are present. Some of, uh, some of them can be detrimental, toxic. So it's important to know what populations of weeds you have before you uh, release your livestock. You know, that uh, thought process that goats can eat anything, they can't. Some plants are actually toxic to goats as well and you don't wanna injure your livestock, but they can be very, very successful at keeping weed populations down. Here are a couple of examples like the field bindweed mite, puncture vine weevil, thistle head weevil. You can see that these are very specific to certain plants. Uh, field bindweed mite only attacks field bindweed. Puncture vine weevil only attacks weevil. Thistle head weevils only attack thistles. The problem is we also have native thistles along with invasive thistles. So these populations are actually causing our endangered thistles to become extinct along with our invasive thistle species. So things to consider with biological control, you get help from mother nature, they control the weeds for you. However, again, like all management practices by itself is not going to create sustainable control. It is not ecologically smart for the biological control agent to kill its hosts. Sometimes you have to actually nurture the population of the, of the, in, of the weed in order to maintain the population of the insects, like these tiny little insects, like, uh, puncture, like the uh, field bindweed mite. If you damage the field bindweed, the field bindweed mite can't survive, and therefore you don't get the benefit of it actually injuring the plant. But on the caveat of that is you have to actually keep the plant growing. So you foster the weed population in order to keep the biological control alive and healthy. Biological organisms can come and go as they plead. They please, they can leave your orchard. They can go from state to state. They don't really pay attention to permits. So just because you release them in your orchard doesn't mean they're going to stay in your orchard. And again, more importantly, it's not ecologically smart for them to kill their host. Once they do, they don't have a food source. So biological control, there is no instance that we know of that the biological control is going to kill an entire population of weeds in a location without the use of other uh, management practices in an overall IPM strategy. So useful tool in your tool belt is not going to kill all of the weeds in a sustainable way. Can't just release insects into your orchard and not have to worry about weeds anymore. Moving on to herbicides, very quickly, it's a primary method of weed control in conventional agriculture, even in fruit orchards, just because they're inexpensive. There's greater flexibility in timing and control. You can make applications to large areas, cause uh, a wide, broad spectrum damage to weeds, like controlling broadleaves and grasses at the same time, while minimizing production costs, minimizing labor costs for the actual implementation of the management, and the results are often quick. I don't know about you guys, but when I, you know, when I spray a plant, I want to see it, you know, melt before my eyes. It's very satisfying. In many cases, you can start to see the effectiveness of your herbicide application within a couple of days, as opposed to implementing some of these other IPM strategies that may take several seasons in order to really note how effective they are. So you have decreased prices in our produce, but you also have an increased demand for the produce that you produce. So demand is still there. Whether or not the cost is still there, of course, fluctuates from year to year. But at the same time, especially in fruit orchards or in fruit production, there's also an increased strict quality guidelines. So you might be able to produce fruit, whether or not that fruit is going to have the quality required to actually be sold you know, into a production system and actually net you profits is also extremely strict in certain situations. All of that equals more emphasis on herbicide applications because of the limited cost, how effective they are if used correctly, and um, limited inputs into the orchard. I am gonna just briefly discuss some of the chemical weed options. This is my disclaimer. You know, me mentioning, again, this is kind of like for all orchards. So me just mentioning this product does not mean automatically that it is labeled for use in your crop. It does not mean that I am endorsing that product alone. I'm just giving examples of what some of the products are and associated with active ingredients. 
It's not an endorsement on my part. I'm not saying that other products are not as good. Additionally, always, always, always read the label. Always read the label. The label supersedes anything and everything I could say about a product. That is the legally binding contract between you and the company. So the label is the important thing to consider. The label will have all the information on which crop you can make an application in, whether you can make an application in your apple orchard or not, what weeds it'll target, what timing to make the application, what rate to make the application, and also how long you know you have to wait till you go into your orchard, all of these different things, you know, uh, trees to avoid, all of the information you need to make a safe and successful application is going to be in the label. If you need help looking up some labels, maybe you have a product that doesn't have a label attached to it. These uh, websites right here, I personally prefer greenbook.net. You can look up the actual labels, the most up-to-date label and any of the supplemental labels that exist for that product in these databases. And I would certainly utilize those, especially if you don't have a, an up-to-date label uh, prior to every application. Labeling will be specific to the weed or the tree, or sorry, it will be specific not only to the weed, but will also be specific to the tree as well. During site preparation, you have herbicides that are uh, specified for perennial weed control. After planting, but before the weeds emerge, is going to be a very specified uh, group of products. You also have non-bearing and bearing trees. After planting, um, after you plant the trees, after the weeds emerge, so post-emergence applications, as opposed to pre-emergence applications, and also non-bearing and bearing trees within that system as well. All of these are going to be mentioned within the labels as being allowed to apply that product or not. How to apply that product or how not to apply that product. So just for a couple of examples, avoid fields infested with perennial weeds if you're developing a, an orchard site, we talked about that. But you can control perennial weeds prior to producing trees when you're not worried about trees being present and being injured. Products that could be utilized are broad spectrum products that control grasses as well as broadleaves like glyphosate. They are systemic. Repeat applications may be needed, especially if you have high concentration of perennials, just because those underground root systems are very difficult even for our stronger herbicides to control. There's also Paraquat, which is the uh, usually the product Gromaxone. This is a restricted use herbicide. It is a burn down, so really you're only going to get the burn down on the surface. Repeat application might be needed as growth occurs, but again, if you do not have a license to apply pesticides in New Mexico, then you cannot apply or even be in possession of this product. The same thing, uh, additionally, I forgot to put it here, with Paraquat, you also have to have a safety training certificate in your possession or in your records possession to apply this product. So there's also a safety training you have to take. Both broad spectrum weed control, you might actually require a non-ionic surfactant, which basically releases water molecules ability to hold together. So instead of beating up on the surface of the leaf, the product lays flat and it actually soaks into the, uh, into the weed more effectively, making the product more effective. The label will specify if you need any kind of surfactant. You might need to irrigate the field prior to application, encourage that weed germination, encourage that growth, because all of these herbicide products are going to work better when the plant is actively growing. Young fruit trees are very susceptible to, or sensitive to herbicides that have longevity in the soil. So diuron, simazine, bromacil, these actually are not labeled for use in orchards, but that doesn't mean that people aren't making applications along fence rows, along areas surrounding orchards in order to get that more permanent weed control. The problem is there may very well be orchard tree roots that extend underneath those fruit, those uh, fence rows, extend underneath those outer areas, and they can come into contact with those roots and can actually kill the tree as a result. I have seen that before. So make sure you're paying attention to the buffer zone uh, suggestions for applications of project products with longevity in the soil, especially if you're applying around orchard systems. Pre-emergent herbicides applied prior to the weed germinating. Therefore, when you see it on the surface, these products do not work. So pendimethalin, Prowl H2O, trifluralin, or uh, treflin are probably going to be the two primary types. Only pre-emergent herbicides that can be used prior to planting trees. They don't have a whole lot of longevity in the soil, and especially if you're transplanting trees, they're not really going to have the ability to injure those. Uh, I am kind of running out of time, so... Uh, 
pre-emergent herbicides require incorporation into the soil. So if you flood irrigate, you might wanna flood irrigate moderately so you don't wash them all the way through. If you can time the application prior to a rain event or depending on your irrigation system, they have to be watered into the soil in order to work. You can even shallow till them into the soil if you don't have an irrigation system, but if you don't incorporate them, they don't work. Limited persistence with penimethylene and trifluralin for best results, apply over clean soil. Never, ever, ever apply a herbicide, even penimethylene, trifluralin, over an exposed tree root, ever, just to play it safe. Uh, this is where I was going to kind of mention a couple of uh, uh, herbicide options for like both non-bearing and bearing stages. So there's flumioxazin, uh, Chateau, which can be both pre and post. I mentioned penimethylin. Trifluralin or Rizalin is another one I haven't mentioned previously. It is only a pre-emergent herbicide. It will not have any impact on weeds that you can see on the surface, only if you make an application prior to its germination. Whether or not Orizalin is labeled for use in your cropping system, read the label and see. Uh, oxyfluorophen, which is goaltender, specific instructions for dormant and bearing trees. See the label for those instructions. And certain formulations can actually emit volatile uh, chemicals, meaning they can evaporate into the air in certain conditions, usually hot, dry conditions. So read the label and follow those recommendations with that. Before the weeds emerge, products labeled for non-bearing and bearing trees. Isoxaven is another pre-emergent herbicide. It is only labeled for bearing trees in New Mexico, usually up to uh, one year after the application. Only controls broadleaves. Isoxamin does not control grasses, whereas the other three that I mentioned, pendimethylin, orizolin, and uh, trifluralin, do control grasses as well as broadleaves. Isoxamin, strictly broadleaves. Rimsulfuron is another one, matrix SG, pre and post for broadleaves and grasses. It has been registered in orchards, but they have to be established orchards. So they cannot be, there cannot be activity of the herbicide in the soil when you're transplanting trees. Again, the label will specify. After the weeds emerge, post-emergence control, carfentrazone ethyl, which is AIM, broad leaves only, does not control grasses. You do not want to come into contact with any kind of tree uh, parts, especially green. Uh, tree limbs, tree bark, tree roots that are still green, that's going to cause injury to those trees. Glufosinate, which is a non-selective, both grasses and broadleaves, it's similar to glyphosate in that, but it is a little bit more of a limited activity in the plant. So it's going to be a little, it's going to look like a contact, but it is a systemic. It's just very, very limited systemic. Therefore, when you make an application, you're probably going to have to apply more of it in comparison to Something like glyphosate, which is a systemic, you apply a little bit to the leaf, it soaks into the plant and it translocates. So something to consider. Glyphosate, we talked about that. You might need to use a water conditioner if you're mixing it into hard water because hard water can actually antagonize uh, glyphosate. Uh, after the weeds emerge, again, post-emergence control, goaltender, oxyfluorophen, again, broad leaves and grasses. Uh, Again, read the label for safe and successful application. I'm really running out of time. I talked about Paraquat earlier. It's a bear, it's a, a burn down plant, but it is a restricted use herbicide. You have to have that safety training. You have to have a license in order to apply it. Uh, if you have grasses predominantly in your orchard and not necessarily broad leaves, you can use Cethoxidem or, oops, Cethoxidem, which is post or Clethidem, which is select. These are grassy herbicides only. They are only going to impact grasses. So as far as their ability to cause, in, uh, cause injury to your broadleaf trees, it's pretty minimal, but read the label when you make an application just to be sure. Uh, here's Clethodem Select Max, which is the other product for grasses. Uh, Flazifot B-butyl is also another product for grasses only. It's not going to cause injury to broadleaf. So if you have a mixture of broadleaf and grasses in your in your landscape, it's not going to injure those broadleaves, only grasses. Uh, Diquat can uh, be used against broadleaves and grasses. It will require a surfactant. Uh, we have better control in warm, dry weather just because it can cause a little bit more uh, damage and burning to the surface of the leaf. The important thing to consider with Diquat is, is that it does have a little bit of residual activity in the soil. It also has a moderate leaching potential. So if you make an application over an area that might have shallow tree roots, it can actually be taken up by those roots and cause damage to the tree as well. So 
Bottom line is, regardless of the herbicides that I mentioned here, regardless of the herbicides that are available, always, always, always read the label. Make sure it's labeled in your crop before you apply it. But anything you need as far as how to make a safe and successful application is going to be in the label. But if you do have questions, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. I'm happy to help. Uh, you also want to try to prevent resistance if you can. Try not to use the same product over and over and over again. Try to use different products and different modes of action. Uh, use herbicides only when necessary. We talked about all these other management practices that can manage weeds in the absence of herbicides. So you want to utilize multiple management strategies besides glyphosate. So if you're looking for grass and broadleaf weed control, maybe utilize one of those grassy herbicides and one of those broadleaf herbicides take mixed together instead of just using glyphosate, a way to sort of trick the weed up. Tank mix to create more broad spectrum control. I just talked about that using the grassy and the broadleaf instead of just glyphosate. Use additives that can improve herbicide efficacy. So I talked about that. If you have hard water, you might want to use a water conditioner if you're applying something like glyphosate because that hard water can antagonize. If you need to know what to add to the tank, usually the label will have uh, uh, specifications. If you have hard water, add this. Add this surfactant for these types of weeds or add the surfactant in this type of situation. And it'll tell you exactly how, to mu how much to put in the tank. Always make applications in accordance with the label, especially in talking about rates. Putting more product in the tank does not mean it's going to work better against the weeds. Just like human beings, we can only take up so many nutrients. Plants can only take in so many herbicides. If, you're not, if it's not working, either switch the active ingredients or make sure you're making an application at a timing when the plant is actively growing. The plant is shut down. The herbicide's not going to work. That has nothing to do with the herbicide or the plant. That has everything to do with how it was applied. Rotate uh, different modes of action. Very last, very last touching point. How do you know if it's a different mode of action? That's a whole different presentation that I could give, but in certain products, you can actually look at the top of the label itself. So here we have Prowl H2O, which is pentamethylin. Here we have Raptor, which is ammonium salt. At the top of pentamethylin, it's a group three herbicide. Here at Raptor, it says a group two herbicide. These are two different numbers. They're two different modes of action. So if you have two products that make up the, um, the, uh, so if you have two active ingredients that make up that product and you have two numbers up here, that's an indication that those two active ingredients are different modes of action. That's good for preventing resistance. If you have two active ingredients here and only one number mentioned up here at the top, that means that those herbicides are the exact same modes of action and you are actually not tricking the plant by adding a different mode of action, meaning it's just gonna get used to that mode of action much more quickly. It's not beneficial for uh, preventing resistance unless the next application that you make is a product different from this one. So if you have active ingredients that are within the same mode of action, try to switch them around when you make the next application to try to get the same amount of weed control with a product that has a different number up here. And with that, I promise I will end. This is where I just talked about a couple of weeds. I'm happy to provide this presentation. If you want to shoot me an email, I can send you a PDF of it. I apologize for going over time, but thank you. I'm, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions you'll have. A great presentation, Leslie. Thank you so much. That was a, a very thorough job um, explaining IPM, um, weed management. Just a couple of questions. Sure. Um, Sorry, everybody. Thank you for joining if you have to cut off. Um, first one, do you have any uh, special tips on Johnson grass removal? So probably the biggest special tip I could give is going to be timing of your application and especially utilizing a systemic herbicide, which is actually going to translocate within the plant. The timing that you want to aim for is going to be a timing in which that herbicide is going to be most impactful to the underground root and rhizome system. And that timing is always going to be in the fall. Mm -hmm. So in mid to late October, maybe even late September, when those temperatures start getting a little bit cooler, that's a signal for the plant to start moving all of its carbohydrates into beefing up its root system to survive the winter months. If your herbicide interferes with that process, and since the plant is actively growing, it translocates and therefore it is more causes more injury. That's just 
that's just the most impactful way that you can make an application to cause injury to that underground root system. The second best timing for that is going to be in the spring when the grass is actually coming up from those underground root systems. Because it's actively growing, um, the, plant, the herbicide is going to be translated more effectively. And therefore, even though it may not impact the roots as much as the fall, what it is impacting is what's above the surface because the plant does have to photosynthesize. So what it's going to do is it's going to use all uh, more of its carbohydrates to regrow anything that's on the surface there. And if you want to follow that with like physical removal, digging it up, that's just that much more of those carbohydrates that have to be utilized in order for it to actually grow above ground tissue. If you prevent that from happening, eventually the underground root system will exhaust itself. You can utilize that with multiple different practices. Uh, if you want to combine herbicides, you can make an application of a herbicide, wait about three weeks, and then dig it up as deeply as you possibly can. That's going to cause that much more injury, and maybe you wouldn't have to make another herbicide application or multiples the next season, if that makes sense. Yeah, great. I think that was a lot of really great <laughs> condensed information for, for Johnson grass. <laughs> um, and then one more thing, uh, you had talked about the plant diagnostic clinic and mm -hmm. um, sending samples for identification of weeds. Can you just explain to people how they can um, get in contact with the plant diagnostic clinic for that, what kind of information they need to provide? Absolutely. So we always make recommendations for uh, people who want to submit plant specimens, insect specimens, diseased plant specimens to go through your local county extension agent. The reason for that being is that the agent has a little bit more knowledge about what's going on locally. Uh, I have a statewide appointment, so I have to address all questions within the state. So there might be uh, a, little, a way to get more information to you in a more timely manner. But more important, if the county agent doesn't know, they can send it to the plant diagnostic clinic on your behalf, meaning that they will mail it on your behalf. Usually they'll mail it overnight, which is what's required. Uh, the other benefit of that is that uh, identifications and management options that we provide from the plant diagnostic clinic are confidential. Therefore, if you send it directly to the plant diagnostic clinic, we can only communicate that information with you. If the county agent sends it in on your behalf, then we can communicate that identification and management to both you and the agent. So therefore, if somebody follows with a same question or a similar question or with the same plant in my case or insect in another case, then maybe the county agent might have a little bit more experience and be able to get that information to you more effectively. Uh, you can certainly send specimens directly to us. We have a website. If you just Google NMSU Plant Diagnostic Clinic, it'll take you directly to our website. You can get in contact with Philip Lujan. I believe he will be giving the presentation on diseases next week. He is our program manager at the Plant Diagnostic Clinic, and he also does all of the disease testing. So you can get in touch with him. There's also um, a link on our website that shows all of our submission forms. As much information as you can fill out on that form before you send us a specimen, the better information we have to try to get you a more accurate answer in a more timely way without having to send emails asking for additional information. Great, thank you. And it looks like we've got a question in the ch chat here. Um, you can pull that up from Randall. Okay, can one pH adjust water to mix with herbicides? So I think the question is, uh, can you adjust the pH of the water within the tank mix in order to better mix your herbicides? You can. Um, I would recommend using a more mild water conditioner in order to do that, like uh, dis dissolvable ah, dissolvable ammonium sulfate. What that's going to do, it's going to moderate the pH just slightly, but also uh, ammonium sulfate is going to be that water conditioner I was talking about with products like glyphosate that actually releases that glyphosate back into the mixture instead of binding it up in hard water systems. So there are other options in order to mediate pH, the, uh, the pH of the water that you're mixing herbicides in. Um, I would be very, very careful with those, especially if you're using any type of acid, like a natural acid, citrus acid, uh, acetic acid, which is vinegar, or using any kind of product acid uh, or like a, a, a company produced product that has an acid in it to mediate pH. Pay very, very close attention to how much of that mediation, uh, mediating agent to add into the tank. Uh, 
because once you lower that pH beyond the ideal range, which is about 4.5 to 6.5 for herbicide activity in plants, it's very hard to bring that pH back up without just adding more water and then you just wasted a bunch of, there's no way to do that if your tank is already full, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have to just pour it out and start over again. The other thing is that certain herbicides like sulfonylureas, for instance, can actually dissolve in highly acidic water systems. So you can lower the pH to the point where it's actually detrimental to the herbicide itself. So if you're going to remediate pH, I would probably utilize that uh, ammonium sulfate method it's very hard to get it so acidic that it's going to be detrimental to the herbicide. Outside of that, just be very, very careful to read and follow label recommendations that you don't go way too acidic with it, because that can also be detrimental to your sprayer as well. You can actually eat away at the, at the rubber O-rings, the metal components it can actually eat your nozzles away and corrode them as well. So uh, certainly, you know, we are high pH in everything that we have here in the, uh, the arid Southwest, our soils, our water, but too much acidity can also be a bad thing as well. But you Great, can, yes. <laughs> Long story short. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, I don't think there are any more questions for now. So thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Um, and thank you for everyone joining us. Don't forget to check out our YouTube page as well as um, next week we do have Philip giving a talk on plant diseases and mm -hmm. diagnostics. So please join us for that. Sounds good. Well, thank you everybody for joining me. And again, if you have any other questions that arise or maybe I didn't cover very effectively because I ran out of time, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. I'm also happy to send you a PDF of the, uh, of the presentation itself. Just email me. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.